Thor, the god of thunder and one of the Avengers, is often associated with a jovial nature thanks to his current representation in the MCU. But when it comes to the comics, things get quite grim. Thor Vikings is one such comic that deals with Nordic curses and the brutality that comes with Thor's past. The god often has to come face to face with foes that don't usually play nice, and this comic's villain is one such Viking, Harold Jekyllson. The result of an unwanted outcome, Harold Jekyllson wields powers far greater than anything Thor has faced before, and the first comic introduces us to how exactly this happens. Let's dive into the story. Thor Vikings issue number one, Endless Ocean. The first panel opens up on quite a grim note as we see one of the women who survived Harold Jekyllson's recent raid on her town. The town is located on the west coast of Norway, and the year is 1003 AD. She is bloodied, bruised, and battered, desperately crawling on the ground in an attempt to escape her sorry fate. Her face is riddled with wounds and warts, and she can barely open her eyes. One can only imagine the horrific fate that she and her village have been through over the past few hours. Nothing Nothing but a blazing fire can be seen in the background as we hear one of the men address Harold Jekyllson and tell him about the success of their raid. They've managed to kill every man and child in the village and are now asking what they should do with the women. Suddenly, a large metal boot comes down on the woman's neck as we hear Harold Jekyllson speak for the first time. Everyone had their way with them, and when his man nods, Harold Jekyllson pushes down on the woman's neck, snapping it in half and killing her instantly. He doesn't need to say more, the orders are clear, and his men are supposed to get to work. The next panel shows us the devastation across the village, giving us a glimpse into the ruthlessness and the brutality of the attack. The remaining men and women are being chopped off, some are getting stabbed while others are being thrown into fires. The entire village has been set ablaze while Harold Jekyllson watches the entire thing while cleaning his sword. After they're done, the men are gather in the longhouse. They roast a pig while enjoying the village's mead. A man's body has been tied to the longhouse's support beam. His body is riddled with arrows, and it has likely been used for target practice or some horrifying drinking game by the archers. Suddenly, Harold Jekyllson orders everyone to be silent and then addresses them all. During his speech, we learn why the Vikings raided one of their own villages. It's because the people of Lakstad, this village, complained about Harold Jekyllson's crew to the king incessantly. Harold Jekyllson and his men would rob the village of their supplies before setting out on each voyage, be it mead, pigs, or other cattle. This is what made the village people give in and complain to the king after years of abuse, a grave mistake that they have now paid for. Harold Jekyllson completes his speech and then turns his head towards the roof. What do the people of Lockstad say now? And when he turns his head towards the roof of the longhouse, we see exactly how brutal this group of Vikings can be because hanging from the roof are flayed and dismembered bodies of all the village people. As the entire longhouse echoes with the sickening laughter of all the Vikings, we see an old man outside finally stir back to life. It seems that the Vikings failed to kill everyone in the village the old man has survived the raid, and when he finally comes back to his senses, he hears Harold Jekyllson address his men once again. And now, let the king declare us renegades, let his soldiers try to find us, we will not even be here. Harold Jekyllson continues his speech, and his men realize that their company is about to leave their lands for good, they will be leaving Iceland and Greenland behind. They are about to go on a voyage of a lifetime, in search of the Americas, in search of the new world. Thor Vikings. For there, no cursed law protects the right of the rabble, there a man may plunder as he pleases, there a man can be viking, what say you? And the entire longhouse echoes with a huge AI in agreement with their leader. The old man has now crept close enough to the longhouse and is peeping inside. He sees what the vikings are planning, what has become of his village, and most importantly, what has become of his people. Some time has passed, and Harold Jekyllson and his men are on the longship, ready for the voyage that lies ahead. But as they leave the shore, they hear a loud cry from behind them. Viking scum, slayers of women, cowardly dogs. Harold Jekyllson is clearly taken by surprise. He asks one of his men about the old man, and he's informed that the man is the village wise man who was presumed dead. The village's wise man continues to scream and curse at the men, calling Harold Jekyllson names. Harold has had enough. He orders one of his men to pass him his bow while the wise man continues cursing them. He then spreads his arms wide, brandishing a dagger in one hand and a stone in another as he proclaims, I curse you, Viking. 
You and the filth that cruise yon dragon ship. To everlasting pain I curse you. Naught but agony awaits you out there on the deep. The wise man then takes the knife and carves out a huge gash in his arm that holds the stone. He then lets his blood drip all over the stone. The stone has ancient runes on it, and with the blood now splattered all over it, the wise man completes his curse. By the power of my blood, by the power of the rune stone that it feeds, let the gods themselves hear my spell of damnation. Though you sail a thousand years a Norseman, you shall not reach the land you seek. As he completes the curse, an arrow comes whizzing through the air and lodges itself directly in the wise man's heart. Harold Jacobson has finally killed everyone from Lakstad, and he now orders his men to use the oars and sail the high wind. He can't wait to leave the old world behind. Back in Lakstad, the wise man coughs blood and draws his last few breaths, and with each breath he claws to complete his curse. By, be, by my blood, by the rune stone, ma'am, may the gods, hear, my, curse. For the next few weeks, Harold Jekyllson and his crew braved the sea waters valiantly, heading west with each passing second. They navigated the sea using the sun and stars with only bloodshed and slaughter on their minds. But as they traveled, weeks turned to months, and months turned into a year. And yet, despite the time spent, they couldn't reach any land. They couldn't reach the promised new world. His men slowly started wondering, pondering questions, but something was clearly amiss. Their minds were fogged. They couldn't form proper sentences. Even the thought of thirst and hunger had left their minds. But Harold Jacobson, he was unfazed, unafraid, and the thought of the new world was still rock solid in his mind. After a few more months, the questions, the doubts, the thoughts, everything vanished from the crew's mind. Only three things remained. Three thoughts by which they hung on. They knew who they were. They knew where they were going. And they knew what they would do when they got there. The years soon turned to decades, but most of the crew by now was dead on the inside, and nature was slowly taking over what remained of their bodies. The decades turned to centuries, and they crossed ships that would have once astounded them, crossed steam-powered vessels that dwarfed their longship, crossed aircraft carriers that failed to even notice their tiny boat. All this would have at one point in the past amazed these men beyond measure. But now, now they all were focused on the things they hung on to, the only three thoughts that had kept them going over the past centuries, who they were, where they were going, and what they were going to do when they got there. And one day, when the decades, the centuries finally turned into a millennium, Harold Jekyllson and his men looked out towards the horizon and spotted land. Their long voyage was finally over, and they had finally arrived in the promised new world. This world was quite different from their world, or rather their time. But like everything else, Harold Jekyllson and his men failed to notice what once would have astounded them. Large skyscrapers, huge metal bridges, the Statue of Liberty, the Staten Island Ferry, everything they failed to notice. For Harold Jekyllson and his men knew that this new world, this new land, would be their prey. It would be their prize, for it was their destiny. The next panel shows us the state of Harold Jekyllson and his crew. Their bodies are withered, many have pieces of their skeleton sticking out from places where skin once should have been. Their armor is rusted and battered, and the ship's wood is creaking and fading away. The look of hunger, determination, and devastation in the men's eyes, it's more fierce than it ever was. Harold Jekyllson grabs the mast and readies himself as their longship approaches the South Street seaport of Manhattan. The year now is 2003 AD, and people who watch them approaching think the ship is a prop for a movie, and the men aboard, they're bound to be movie characters. A kind man bends down and offers his hand to Harold Jekyllson. Hey, hey, what are you guys here for? Harold Jekyllson plunges his sword straight through the man's skull the very next second and says, Everything. Harold Jekyllson is hungry for blood. It has been a millennia since he felt his sword carve flesh, since he whiffed the scent of blood in the air. He orders his men to kill everyone in sight while the people of New York struggle to come to terms with what's happening in front of them. The ones closest to the Vikings run for their lives while the ones further away are sure that this is some sort of prank, that there's got to be a camera somewhere waiting to record their every reaction. But when the Vikings reach them and slice their heads off, it's clear this is no prank. A police car patrolling the area finally reaches the seaport upon hearing the commotion, and even the officers can't believe what they are seeing. People of New York are being slaughtered with each passing second, but before the male officer can call it in, one of the Vikings lodges his axe right in the police officer's skull. The female officer staggers and starts to retreat as she draws her gun and watches the approaching horde of fleeing civilians and murdering Vikings. Harold Jekyllson is aiming for a father-son duo when the police officer steps between them and starts firing at him. The duo manages to escape, but when the father glances behind him, he watches the decapitated head of the officer flying through the air. Harold Jekyllson bends down and picks up the officer's chopped-off head. What kind of place is
is this, where men send their women out to fight, and this is the first time Harold Jekyllson has had such a question form in his mind over the past hundreds of centuries. He starts to notice the tall silver towers and the iron carts that don't use horses to ferry people around. And although he has these questions, this doesn't deter him one bit. As his men continue to slaughter people left and right, he watches three police cars approaching them. With a single swipe of his hand, Harold Jekyllson crumples the bonnet of the car approaching him and brings it to an abrupt stop. He then picks the car up with the same hand and launches it into the Hudson River, while the officers inside can do nothing but look on in horror. Harold Jekyllson and his crew didn't understand this place or its people, but they knew one thing about it. It was all theirs. All theirs for the taking. His men have now set this part of the city ablaze. They are piling the bodies of all the people they murdered, while one of the men holds a young blonde girl by the hair and approaches Harold Jekyllson. She'll do. Too long have I gone without that as well. The girl can do nothing but look on in horror and beg for her life, for her dignity. But everything seems lost. Suddenly it starts raining and the fires are put out instantly. The next second, a large crack of lightning blasts the Vikings surrounding the girl, and we see Thor land between the woman and the Vikings. He orders the girl to run for her life as he stares down Harold Jekyllson and his crew. I know not from whence thou came, O Carrion, nor what thy purpose is this day. Only thy fate is clear to me. As Thor finishes his words, Harold Jekyllson knows exactly who he's facing. He's facing the God of Thunder. But it's not fear in his eyes or voice. There's a sense of excitement, a hint of amusement. And the next page is dedicated to a single panel showing us exactly that. Harold Jekyllson is chuckling. His face is withered. He's missing an eye. His flesh is rotting and his teeth have yellowed beyond measure. But despite the state his body appears to be in, Jekyllson seems to be hiding an ace up his sleeve. Thor Vikings, issue number two, Kingdom of Iron. Harold Jekyllson stares down Thor and looks him straight in the eyes. No inkling who it is you face down, no idea at all. Hazard a guess a god of thunder, but Thor has no patience for Harold Jekyllson's games. He thinks of him as an undead corpse brought back to life to terrorize living humans. Thor leaps in the air with his hammer ready to slam down on Harold Jekyllson's head. When the Viking says, you think of me a maggot? Strike and see, O oh god of thunder. And when Thor's hammer strikes Harold Jekyllson, the sound of breaking bones echoes throughout the street. But the Viking leader from a millennia ago is completely unfazed. The bolt of lightning has barely left a mark on his already scarred and decomposing body. That was not my skull breaking, says Harold Jekyllson, with a hint of satisfaction in his eyes. And indeed, the Viking is right. The sound of bones breaking and crunching when Thor struck? Well, it was the hands of the God of Thunder himself. Hands that are now broken and mangled in different directions beyond measure. Harold Jekyllson then turns to his men and commands them to continue the raid. He's tired of them standing around and gawking at what just happened. Harold Jekyllson can take care of Thor himself, and once his men resume their duties, he sends Thor flying away with a single swipe of his right arm. And within the next few hours, Harold Jekyllson's crew has wreaked havoc on New York City. The streets are lined with decapitated and mangled corpses, broken cars, intermittent fires, and the occasional war cry of a Viking for having cut down yet another innocent victim with ease. The fact that they were surrounded by sights they never seen, castles made out of iron, people dressed in shiny clothes, this, this wasn't enough to stop them. Maybe make them pause and wonder for a while, but nowhere near enough to stop them. They didn't leave anyone, not the ladies enjoying their life and exercising without a care for the outside world, and nor the school children making their way home on a school bus. The men slaughtered without concern, without mercy, without any liabilities. Back to the fight between Harold Jekyllson and Thor, the God of Thunder is losing his mind. Nobody, not a single foe he has faced in the past few decades on Earth has managed to hurt him, let alone break his hands and draw blood from his nose with a single punch. This is simply unfathomable for Thor, but Harold Jekyllson, he is someone who seems to have prepared for this. It seems he has been waiting for this. He knows about Thor's powers. He knows, now that the God of Thunder can't use his hands, he can't call Mjolnir. And if he can't call Mjolnir, he can't use lightning against Harold Jekyllson. He taunts Thor with a disgusting smile strewn across his decomposing face. He knows Thor is helpless, he knows the god will have to turn away from this fight and run if he wishes to survive. But maybe Harold Jekyllson has gloated enough because the next second, Thor kicks the Viking across the face using his still working and agile legs. Although it seems to phase Harold Jekyllson a bit, the Viking simply stands there when Thor attacks him with an elbow. In a desperate attempt to finish off his foe, Thor headbutts Harold Jekyllson directly in the face. And although this hurts the Viking, it hurts the god of thunder even more. This draws more blood from Thor's 
Hunter's face who slumps down on the road due to this sudden impact. Harold Jacobson swipes his sword at Thor in an attempt to decapitate him, and Thor barely manages to escape it with milliseconds to spare. You're worth no iron of mine pretender, says Harold Jacobson as he drops his sword on the ground. He knows his hands are more than enough to take care of the god of thunder. Some god you are. Small wonder you hide out in the mortal world. I doubt they'd let the likes of you in Asgard, you pathetic fleck of spit. And as he says this, Harold Jacobson picks up Thor by his hair, and we see Thor's mangled and beaten face. It now somewhat resembles the decomposing face of Harold Jacobson himself. But the Viking isn't done yet. He slams Thor into a nearby pillar, then punches Thor again and again until the God of Thunder's entire face is covered in blood. On the other side of town, military and police forces have managed to mobilize in huge numbers. They're determined to respond and take down the threat they face. But when they approach the city center, supposedly where Harold Jekyllson's crew is wreaking havoc, they are faced by a horrific obstacle. All the roads have been barricaded using a huge pile of decapitated heads. Hundreds and thousands of heads that once belonged to innocent civilians now prevent the forces from proceeding any further. Back on the seaport, Harold Jekyllson has managed to find a way to take care of Thor for good. He knows that nobody but Thor can lift Mjolnir, which is why he has tied Thor's hammer to the God of Thunder's throat using an iron chain. He drags Thor by the ankle towards the sea. Thor is barely conscious, desperately holding on for his dear life, when Harold Jekyllson picks him up and tells Thor that he knows Thor can't die by drowning, but this should give him enough time to escape Harold Jekyllson's brutality, enough time so that Thor can mend his wounds and heal, so that he always remembers the lesson a Viking him taught him on this day. Then with a brutal kick, Harold Jekyllson sends Thor flying off the seaport and into the East River below. Thor sinks to the bottom in an instant due to Mjolnir being tied around his neck and on the surface, Harold Jekyllson stands with a gleaming smile spread across his horrific face. I'll build my kingdom here. Harold Jekyllson is then addressed by his crew. They tell him that the human forces are on their way ready to wage war, and this is when Harold Jekyllson pulls out his ace. He loads up his crew in the longship, and with a simple swing of his sword, the sail unfurls and the longship takes off into the air, flying through the congested streets of New York City as though it had always been a part of the city's landscape. To this day, people debate how the Vikings managed to pull this off, how they made their longship fly, but nobody knows. Some speculate that the Vikings had a sorcerer among their crew, while others debate that the Vikings had gone to the underworld and struck a deal with the Kings of Darkness. Either way, the police and military forces now had a flying longship coming their way, and the men on the ground or in the air didn't know what to make of this sight. And when their leader spots Harold Jekyllson and his decomposing crew, he orders his men to fire, and so does Harold Jekyllson. And when Harold Jekyllson screams, I, a bright jet of red flame shoots from the mouth of the dragon figurehead at the front of his longship. Any human on the ground that comes in contact with this fire disintegrates instantly. The rest of Harold Jekyllson's crew then jumps down and starts cutting down men as though they're made of paper. Up in the air, helicopters desperately try to support the ground crew, but they are soon taken out by spears flung in the air by the Vikings. And when the choppers crash into the ground, they only add to the destruction and chaos already taking place on the streets. Needless to say, it's a massacre, and modern machines and arms stand no chance against these seemingly invincible Vikings. It was all over within minutes. Harold Jekyllson and his crew stood over their fresh new pile of dead bodies as they watched the rest of the men flee while grabbing any survivors. The remaining civilians in the city now know there's no hope for them, and all of them have barricaded themselves in their homes in a desperate attempt to survive as long as possible. Harold Jekyllson knows he has won this battle, and his reign over the new world has now begun. Thor, meanwhile, has regained consciousness and has managed to clamber up and out of the water. He sits against the wall, still panting and regaining his energy when he sees someone approaching him. S. Strangey? And indeed, the person he's facing is none other than Doctor Strange, the Sorcerer Supreme himself. Downright bizarre, I'd say. We need to talk Thor. Thor Vikings, issue number three, Time Like a River. The third issue opens up with an interview with the mayor of New York City, who is here to address all the rumors and news coming out of the District of Manhattan. The news crew has chosen an appropriate location, Greenpoint, New York, from where the District of Manhattan can be spotted in the background directly across the East River. The reporter goes on to interview the mayor, who is exasperatingly nonchalant about the whole sequence of events that have taken place over the past day. The mayor is awfully confident about the next strike force he is about to send into 
the city, the Avengers alongside a full regiment of Marines. He guarantees his people that by this time tomorrow, he will have the entire thing in control, and people will soon doubt if Manhattan was ever in trouble. But Mr. Mayor, with these invaders described as indestructible and every major bridge and tunnel into Manhattan being sealed off, don't you think this situation might be slightly more serious than that? S -s Strangey? But before the mayor can answer this query, a huge medieval era spear comes flying through the air and lodges it directly through the side of the mayor's skull, killing him instantly. We now head back into Manhattan where Harold Jekyllson is handing the backup spear to one of his crew members. He's managed to hit the mayor directly in the head on his first throw. He won't be needing the second spear anymore. The district of Manhattan, meanwhile, looks nothing short of a battlefield. The streets are filled with destroyed cars, decapitated and dismembered bodies, cars and buildings burning on every corner and the cries of slaughtering Vikings at each step. They were killing and slaughtering everyone that caught their eye, and when there was no one on the street, they would head into a random building, slaughter and rape their way through it, until every door and window was covered in the blood of their victims. Despite all this pillaging of the New World, despite having established his new kingdom, Harold Jekyllson knew there was a key ingredient missing that would complete his new reign of terror, if only he could find it. The thick storm clouds circling over Manhattan courtesy of Thor didn't please Harold Jekyllson either. He knew the god was still around, that the clouds were growing thick and heavy with each passing second, preparing themselves for the next confrontation between the two of them. And then, Harold Jekyllson finally found it. His throne room, every ruler's right, every king's desire, and his throne room, it was the Empire State Building. Thor has now been taken into Doctor Strange's lair. His face, although still bruised and battered, looks much better than before. The God of Thunder is clearly healing rapidly, but the remnants of his last battle are strewn across his entire face. The right wing of his helmet has been broken off. He still clutches his wrist desperately, waiting for his bones to mend themselves, and most of all, the look of defeat in his eyes can't seem to go away. What's the straw death? Harold Jekyllson mentioned it before throwing you into the East River, asks Doctor Strange as he goes through his ancient books, looking for any clues that can help him defeat the Vikings. Thor goes on to tell Doctor Strange that it is a lowly phrase used by Norsemen for men who die in their beds, those who die the life of a coward, someone who hides from battle all their lives. But before Thor can say more, something clicks in his brain. If Doctor Strange knew what Harold Jekyllson said to him before throwing him into the East River, then why didn't he intervene and help the God of Thunder? How could you sit and gawk while ancient evil took Manhattan in its grip? But they don't call him Sorcerer Supreme for nothing. Doctor Strange pours himself some wine casually and goes on to tell Thor that after seeing what the Vikings were capable of, what Harold Jekyllson could do to Thor with ease, he knew that he didn't stand a chance against them. It would have been suicidal to face Harold Jekyllson and his crew head-on without any sort of plan or some sort of ace up his sleeve. He then lies down on his couch, still going over more books about magic looking for something that could aid him in the upcoming battle against the Vikings. But Thor has different plans. Even though his wounds and broken bones are healing rapidly, his pride is more than scarred. And the only way to fix it is by facing Harold Jekyllson and his crew again, and defeating them for good this time. This is when Doctor Strange looks up from his book with a look of concern for Thor. Not a good idea. I'm afraid, Thor, you'll only get your ass handed to you again as I believe, probably twice as badly as before. He then goes on to review and recount the events that have happened in the past two days and what he and Thor have learned from them. First things first, they know that these creatures they face are frighteningly powerful. Nothing is able to stand in their way, nor guns, nor metal, and not even gods. Thor himself is living proof of that, and the way in which Harold Jekyllson disposed of him, the leader himself, is another force to be reckoned with. The second thing they've gotten to know is that no matter their appearance, and no matter the year they've appeared in, the warriors seem to be genuine Vikings. They use authentic Viking dialogue true to their time, and this is quite odd considering that Thor and Doctor Strange are currently in the 21st century. And even though odd, this displacement of time, the existence of the Vikings outside their time, is the clue they both need to start looking into this case. Thor is now ready for battle with Mjolnir brandished in his right hand, but something holds him back. There's a look of doubt in his eyes. Even though he's hungry for battle, he knows Doctor Strange isn't wrong. In a desperate attempt, he tries to ask the wizard if he doesn't have some sort of magic to reverse their fortunes. Maybe a spell that gives Thor the power to take these Vikings down. The God of Thunder would even be happy with some sort of wizardry that kills all these Vikings instantly. But Thor knows he's desperately grasping for straws that don't exist. And Doctor Strange tells him the exact same thing, but he is much more casual about it. Tell you what, I'll handle the Hocus Pocus, and you stick to hitting people with your hammer. Now follow me. He then guides Thor into a mysterious room that is covered in nothing but pure white light and flowing across the room is what looks like silvery water glittering in the air. The only difference is that it 
seems to be more viscous and more chaotic. Doctor Strange tells Thor that this is the room where time flows like a river, and it allows the viewer to observe time in a linear form. It is one of Doctor Strange's favorite rooms. The determination to stop the Vikings is now more than apparent in the sorcerer's eyes as he wades his hand through time. He tells Thor that this is the place where they can find out what they need to know about the Vikings, take away clues and strengths that will help them win this battle, and use them to their advantage. But before Thor can mull over Doctor Strange's sudden change of expression, he quickly changes the topic. Right then, down to business. Vikings. That's what? 700 to 1150 AD? And as he scans through the given time period, within minutes he comes across Harold Yekelson and his crew slaughtering and raiding the city of Lakstad. The images are a jumbled compilation of the events. They are in order yet together, shown simultaneously somehow. Doctor Strange can see Harold Yekelson killing off the woman by snapping her neck under his feet. He can see the Viking leader giving orders to his men in the longhouse, their longship departing for the new world, and the raging village wise man cursing them in the background. Thor can't believe his eyes, so these Vikings are indeed centuries old, a millennia to be precise. But how can this be? How can these Vikings survive so long and become so powerful? Their bodies wither away with time, yet their minds are totally intact. Thor, um, I think this idiot might have something to do with that, says Doctor Strange as he guides the River of Time to show the two of them the wise man cursing Harold Jekyllson and his crew. The alleged village wise man, that's rune magic. Very powerful and complicated. Not for amateurs at all. Though you sail for a thousand years? Oh, that's marvelous. The act of a true fart. Things are slowly starting to piece together for Doctor Strange. He now knows what led the Vikings to become this powerful. He shows Thor the exact moment the village wise man cut his forearm and fed his blood into the rune stone. That is what activated this botched curse. It was like a monkey playing with an atomic bomb. The man had no clue what he was doing or creating. Thor doesn't understand. If Harold Jekyllson was listening to all this, he would have killed the wise man by now. And that is exactly what they watch happen next, as he is shot in the chest by Harold Jekyllson. Doctor Strange then points to all the blood feeding into the rune stone after the wise man is killed. It's not just a pint or two, it's all of his blood. And with the wise man now dead, there's nothing stopping the rune stone from drinking all of it. All of a sudden, a small spell, a curse from a naive man, has become a thousand times more powerful. But Thor is still confused. Did the spell turn them into demons so that the Vikings could survive a thousand-year-long voyage? Doctor Strange then goes on to explain to him that these are still men, but their lives have been trapped in the same body for ten centuries, binding the life of all these centuries into their current bodies. He feels Thor's lucky to have even survived an encounter with Harold Jekyllson in the first place. With the wise man dead and the rune stone feeding on his blood, the stone didn't only absorb his blood, but the wise man's escaping life force, his soul. This is why the spell is now operating on a completely different level, a level even unfathomable for Doctor Strange until he witnessed this sequence of events for himself. Thor can't help but blame the wise man. What could drive someone who's supposed to be wise to play with eldritch powers in such a manner? Doctor Strange then shows Thor what the wise man had witnessed. He had just seen his family, his entire village get butchered in front of his eyes, Asgard's gates, that such chaos should be unleashed by the spilled blood of this vengeful fool. Doctor Strange agrees. He ruffles his hair desperately trying to think of a way to get past this curse. And then it finally strikes him, all thanks to what Thor said just now. The spilled blood of the village wise man, his blood could just be the key to break this curse or to at least find a way past it. Doctor Strange knows it's the blood of the village wise man that still holds the curse and grants the Vikings their powers. And although he can't go back in time to stop the wise man from cursing the Vikings in the first place because he's forbidden, he can still indeed go past the wise man's time and look at his surviving bloodline. Doctor Strange waves his hands, and the river of time changes its course to show them the faces of all the descendants of the village wise man over the past ten centuries. Noblemen, peasants, kings, servants, every descendant, and their lives. Dost thou hope to find the equal of his incantation's power? asks Thor, and Doctor Strange tells him that he's right in a manner of speaking. They're going to exploit the wise man's bloodline to their advantage. The blood passed on through the ages carries magic, genetic memory, essence of life, and more. It's the exact thing they might need to break and get past this curse. Doctor Strange then guides Thor through the wise man's surviving bloodline. At first, he had two sons and a daughter. A generation later, he ended up having grandchildren, eight boys and seven girls. They then travel a century past his grandchildren, and the wise man now has more than 200 descendants. A sly smile is spreading across Thor's face. He now understands what Doctor Strange is getting at. They're mostly farmers, fishermen, a carpenter or two, another wise man, and a goat 
goat herder. Oh god, I wish I hadn't seen that. But you do understand, Thor, don't you? We don't want farmers or fishermen, do we? Nay, strange. Tis warriors we need. And as they scan through time, a century later they come across a Viking village. An entire crew of Vikings is ready to leave for a voyage, when suddenly a strong voice echoes in the background urging them to wait. It's a large, strong woman carrying a huge axe on her shoulders, as though it were made out of cotton. She points to herself and says that she wants to go too. It's Sigrid, a strong Viking woman, one of the descendants of the village wise man. But despite her prowess and intimidating form, the men of the Viking crew refuse to take her along, all because she's a girl. They tell her that girls can't be Vikings, and they've told her this over a million times, but she refuses to budge or give in. But this isn't fair! I am tougher and stronger than any of you, and you all know that. The entire village does! A scrawny Viking from the crew cuts her off when she tells them that she can do everything better than them, run faster, row harder, throw a spear further than any one of them. Hell, she can hack an entire sheep with a single blow. The scrawny Viking then asks her if she can pee standing up, and the entire crew bursts out laughing. Despite being inferior to her in every way, they all refuse to accept her as a part of their crew. The scrawny Viking that spoke earlier was Ragnar the Dreamy, and he goes on to add, Girls are no good for fighting and raiding Sigrid. If you're really lucky, someday I'll show you what they're good for. But Sigrid has had enough. She smacks Ragnar across his face so hard that the Viking's left eye pops out of his eye socket instantly. The entire village and the crew fall silent and look on in horror as Sigrid simply calls him an oaf and walks off. But in this recent show of overwhelming force, the Viking crew leaves for the raid without Sigrid. She slumps onto a log beside her father, holding her face in her hands, wondering if she'll ever know the thrill of battle in her life. Even though her father sympathizes with her, he knows the way of his people. He knows that Sigrid would eventually be married off without having tasted or enjoyed a battle or raid in her life. But Sigrid has different dreams. She doesn't want to marry. She wants to sail the seas, go out on adventures, ride the waves of excitement, and land on the shores of glory. Just once, just once in my life, I'd like to hear the clash of sword on sword in the battlefield, the meaty hook as the iron cleaves. But before she can complete the sentence, her body turns translucent, and the next second, Sigrid vanishes into thin air. Her father is baffled as he desperately looks around, trying to find out what happened to his daughter. We go back to the room of time with Doctor Strange and Thor. Thor asks Doctor Strange what he's done with Sigrid, and the sorcerer tells him that she's being housed in a space between her time and theirs currently. Thor needn't worry about her. He wants the two of them to move on and see what else they can find. They now go ahead in time, several centuries ahead. By this time, the wise man's bloodline has now reached Europe and spread all over it. His descendants now number in the tens and thousands, and it is now the time of the Teutonic Knights. Teutonic Knights belong to the Teutonic Order, which was a Catholic religious military institution of the 1190 AD designed to militarize and spread the Catholic rule across all the lands. Doctor Strange and Thor are now looking at Sir Magnus of the Danes, a formidable knight with a massive body that is hacking down men like butter without a care for their life in the world. He towers over most men and wields a huge long sword in one hand while brandishing a mace in the other. It is not just men he faces alone, he is taking care of opposing armies with great ease and it seems his reputation precedes him. For at the mere sight of him and at the mere mention of his name, men from the opposing armies start fleeing in the opposite direction, desperate to save their own lives because their leaders reject the teachings of the church. Sir Magnus of the Danes decapitates three men with a single swipe of his longsword as he screams, You scum! You worthless pigs that speak of freedom of worship! Here is your freedom of worship, you pox-ridden whoreson dogs! He is out to spread the word of his church and take down any who oppose it. And the only opposition that remains in front of him is an unarmed, cowering old man begging for his life. But showing mercy isn't the way of the church or the way of Sir Magnus of Danes. He lifts his mace high into the air and then brings it down directly on the head of the old man with such force that it crushes his entire skull immediately. When it is done, he's managed to convert and take care of another opposing village, and he now marches alongside other knights of the Teutonic Order as he asks about his next assignment. The church apparently now wants him to go to France, and he has been ordered to be thorough, but as Sir Magnus of the Danes diverges away from his fellow knights to head to France, his entire body and horse turn translucent and slowly vanish into thin air. Back in the room of time with Doctor Strange and Thor, the God of Thunder isn't totally convinced by the induction of Sir Magnus of Danes. Someone who can cut down people like fodder in the name of religion isn't someone Thor can approve of. After all, he's a god belonging to one of the opposing religions. But Doctor Strange tells him that they can't and don't 
don't have the luxury to choose. They've already gone through centuries and have sifted through thousands of the wise man's descendants. Despite these numbers, they've only managed to find two viable and worthy warriors. They need to keep looking and they need to find more warriors. And so, they travel further into the future, scanning through decades and centuries until they finally arrive in 1945, the year of World War II. By now, the wise man has over half a million descendants and the only viable warrior they can find is in this time, is Eric, a Nazi fighter pilot that is flying circles around the opposition with ease. His crew is outnumbered by the opposition, and yet they are managing to put up a good fight. And even though Eric's good, the sheer number of his enemies is causing him to lose his men one by one, and it's not long before Eric manages to lose concentration, and when he looks in front of him, it's already too late. A crashing Spitfire is headed straight for him and is mere inches away. It's too late for Eric to eject now, but that is when Doctor Strange does his trick and the crashing Spitfire goes straight through Eric and his translucent aircraft. The next second, Eric and his aircraft have vanished into thin air. And that's it. Thor and Doctor Strange have run out of centuries to sift through. They're now in the present, and they've only managed to find three worthy warriors. Thor isn't pleased. He was hoping for more, especially with half a million descendants to sift through. Thor was sure that they'd find more warriors. It's then that Doctor Strange tells him that there were indeed tons of warriors, many descendants of the village wise man that went to war, but none of them were this good. Most of them got killed instantly, or within the first five minutes of their battles. Sigrid, Magnus, and Eric are head and shoulders above the rest, and they're actually waiting for us nearby. I can't wait to hear you explain it all to them. It took Thor and Doctor Strange 24 hours to find Eric, Sigrid, and Sir Magnus of the Danes. And during this time, Harold Jekyllson and his Vikings have managed to change the entire landscape of Manhattan. Despite the attack headed by the Avengers and the Marines, they have been defeated by the Vikings. Captain America is bruised all over his body and has almost lost his right eye. Iron Man's armor is riddled with hundreds of dents and he is unable to walk and is being held up by Cap. In the background, Hawkeye seems to have lost consciousness and is being escorted away by the Scarlet Witch and the Vision. Captain America is screaming for a medic as he feels Tony's pulse slipping away and slowing down. The Marines are doing what they can while slowly retreating their entire forces away from Manhattan. Harold Jekyllson's hold over his new kingdom is now stronger than ever, and even the humans recognize that by now. Thor Vikings, number four. Fight the good fight. The Marines have now returned to their base, but the sheer loss of soldiers and the current state of the Avengers prompts the seniors to send in a recon unit to identify what happened to the remaining Marine soldiers that did not return. Two intelligence officers fly over Manhattan, desperately looking for any sign of the missing soldiers when they finally find them. A look of grim hopelessness washes over one of the officers' faces as he realizes the level of threat they face. In the middle of Times Square, thousands and thousands Thousands of decapitated Marines' heads have been propped up on pikes and sticks. Each face still bears the expression and emotion each of the Marines experienced when they were killed. Some sport the expression of horror, others sadness, some are screaming, while others seem to have accepted their fate. Back in Sanctum Sanctorum, Thor and Doctor Strange have managed to brief Sigrid, Eric, and Sir Magnus of the Danes about the situation they face. Eric is in disbelief, despite having been told again and again, despite watching Sir Magnus and Sigrid right in front of him, he still can't believe he is being asked by the God of Thunder himself to help him, to help him alongside his ancestors that stand in front of him, pulled out from different time periods, time periods he's only read about and occasionally seen in the movies. So, what have I been drinking, and when do I wake up? He asks, sheepishly, still unable to grasp the reality of the situation they face. Thor is sympathetic, he understands how Eric must feel, but the fighter pilot simply has too many questions. He starts by asking how the four of them can even understand each other. They're all from different time periods, different countries, and different heritages. That is when Doctor Strange chimes in and tells them that this is his doing, a simple translation spell to help them all understand each other. Eric then says, of course, another spell. How stupid of me. And now Doctor Strange knows it's time for some hard-hitting news. He steers Eric and the others towards the empty white space and then projects what's currently happening in New York City. Men, women, and children are being slaughtered like sheep by the decomposing Vikings. Decapitated heads 
heads and limbs are flying off in every direction, while the Vikings trample over the bodies of the dead as though walking through a field of soft flowers. The three descendants can't help but stare in disgust and go through multiple emotions at the same time. This has left them at a loss for words, each one of them, Sigrid, Sir Magnus of the Danes, and Eric, now utterly speechless. Doctor Strange knows that they need some time, which is why he pulls Thor aside and then walks with him out of the room. Minutes pass by until Sir Magnus of the Danes breaks the silence by turning his gaze towards Eric's aircraft. He and Sigrid discuss the aircraft. They are unable to comprehend or explain its existence. Sigrid feels it's an iron eagle, tamed by humans for use in battles, but Sir Magnus of the Danes thinks he knows better. He knows this is a craft powered by sorcery, something decreed by the church to be unlawful. And Eric? Well, he is still coming to terms with what he just saw. It's all real. Everything Thor and Doctor Strange told him. The slaughter, the Vikings, his ancestors, what they have to do. It's all real. He grabs his packet of smokes from his pocket in a desperate attempt to calm his nerves, but he's all out. He then frustratingly turns towards Sigrid and Sir Magnus of the Danes and tells them about his aircraft. It's a Messerschmitt 109. And will you please stop poking it with your sword? Let's just stick to the subject at hand. Eric is a Nazi fighter pilot, which is why the insignias on his craft puzzle Sigrid and Sir Magnus of the Danes. It sports the cross of the Holy Church, which is relatable to Sir Magnus of the Danes, while Sigrid mistakes the angled swastika used by the Nazis as a triskele, a Nordic symbol used to signify death and rebirth. But that is when Eric confesses. He needs to. That thing has nothing to do with life anymore, Sigrid. It's a stain on my bloody good aircraft. My country is in the hands of a maniac. The men I fight have come to defeat this maniac's regime, but in doing so they kill hundreds of German civilians every day. But, the sooner they defeat us and win the war, the sooner we can get rid of his regime. God, no wonder I hate politics. Eric then stops and stares Sir Magnus of the Danes and Sigrid straight in the eyes. He asks them if they're ready for the task at hand, ready to travel into the future, to defeat ghouls from their past, created by a mistake at the hands of one of their ancestors. Why, how can we not Eric, says Sir Magnus. They're killing children, says Sigrid with a sad, yet revengeful tone. Eric agrees, because for once it would be nice if he fought for something decent in his life. As the three of them come to this conclusion, the scene all over New York is growing grim with each passing second. It reflects the hatred and the lust for slaughter felt by Harold Jacobson and his crew. Almost every street sign and every building in the city has been draped by the dead bodies of its citizens. Decapitated, disemboweled men, limbless women, and battered and wounded children have been bound to almost every standing structure using anything the Vikings could find. Iron chains, ropes, intestines, each body has been plastered to each structure as an act of defiance, as a warning to anyone that might dare to oppose their rule. The remaining citizens of the city were being treated like animals, like slaves. For them, the city had become a living embodiment of hell. Those who had yet managed to escape the massacre had barricaded themselves inside their homes, inside buildings the Vikings had already raided, hungry and dying of thirst. These citizens dared not enter the streets or even the alleyways, for they knew that if they were seen, they were inviting death to their doorsteps. And this brought chaos, and rendered each citizen fighting for their own life. For when a group was being herded like sheep, all anyone could hope was for that let it not be them, let it be the ones at the front, let it be the ones that dared and escape from their impending fate, but oh God, please not them. But there was no escape. Anyone who tried to avoid punishment, anyone who tried to run away, was shot down instantly. And then, Harold Jekyllson came out of the shadows like the reaper of death himself. The tall ones only, he ordered his men, and the next second, anyone shorter than six feet was slaughtered instantly. And when the remaining tall men wondered why it was their turn, why Harold Jekyllson wanted them, the answer was clear. They were wanted for their large and big bones. And as the remaining tall men and women were being herded into his throne room, the Empire State Building, the people couldn't help but turn on their own kind, towards the choppers observing each passing moment from high up in the air. They screamed and bellowed at their own kind. How could they just stand by and watch? Watch while the rest of them were killed off, while the tall ones were being picked off for whatever deviant plan Harold Yekelson had for them. But there came no response. The choppers wouldn't even dare get closer, as the tall men were forced into the Empire State Building, and the door was shut behind them. Back in the Sanctum Sanctorum, Doctor Strange's residence, Sigurd, Sir Magnus of the Danes, and Eric have finally found Thor and Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange is busy brewing a potion of some sorts. Eric is shaken to the core, but he can't stop but wonder how Sigurd and Sir Magnus 
Magnus of the Danes are so cool about this. And they both go on to tell him that this kind of slaughter is sort of normal for the time period where they come from. Sigurd tells him that in her time, goblins are known to attack unsuspecting visitors of the night, while the Kraken will drag any and every ship down along with its sailors if they dare cross his path. Sir Magnus of the Danes, on the other hand, is himself known to kill, disembowel, and slaughter anyone who worships anything other than Christianity. You ride in an iron eagle, Eric. Try to keep an open mind, says Sigurd, as the two of them try to comfort him. Doctor Strange is now ready for them, because he is going to use their blood, the blood of their ancestor, the village wise man, to empower the potion that he is brewing. He has Sigurd, Eric, and Sir Magnus of the Danes cut their forearms and spill their blood in the cauldron as he finishes the potion. He promises them that with this ritual complete, one that mimics the rune magic used by their ancestors, the four of them will be unstoppable. Their weapons will penetrate every metal, every being, and their strength will be horrifying to their enemies. And now that the potion is ready, Doctor Strange gives Thor more insight into what rune magic actually is. It's like a malicious genie released from a bottle. Although it will grant the three wishes, it will twist and misinterpret the words in order to get back at whoever is wishing, which is why cursing a band of Vikings to everlasting pain has resulted in unstoppable undead warriors. He then offers the potion he brewed to each of them, Sigurd, Eric, Sir Magnus of the Danes, and of course Thor. Though hesitant at first, each one of them finally drinks the potion, because they need to take down Harold Jekyllson and his crew and save any remaining citizens left alive in the city. Back on the Empire State Building, Harold Jekyllson is busy enjoying his victory. He has conquered this part of the New World and conquered it valiantly in his own eyes. He had slaughtered, pillaged, and raped to his heart's content, and now was sitting at the top of the highest tower from where he could keep an eye on his new kingdom. He could see the western coastline which marked the western border of his kingdom and to the east. There were more unconquered cities of the New World, and they were all for his taking. At this same time, when Harold Jekyllson planned his future conquests, something churned in his stomach. He knew that feeling, that feeling of impending doom, that something was coming for him, something familiar with nothing but ill intentions armed his way. He sat upon a horrific throne crafted from the bones, heads, and skulls of all the tall men he had ushered into the Empire State Building earlier. And despite his victory, despite his conquest of New York City, the ball of maggots that was once his heart started beating faster than ever as he anticipated the feeling of impending doom coming to fruition in the next few hours. Sigurd, Eric, and Sir Magnus of the Danes, alongside Thor and Doctor Strange, are now back on the streets of New York City. Eric's ancestors marvel at the tall skyscrapers and the beautifully manicured lawns when they are suddenly approached by one of the Vikings. Thor, on the other hand, is more than eager to start their assault. His face contorts with anger and rage as he orders the rest of them to start the attack. The Viking is then joined by two more of his crew members, but they're no match for Doctor Strange's new creations. With a single swing of her large axe, Sigurd slices one of the Vikings in half from head to toe. Sir Magnus of the Danes decapitates and shatters the skull of another using his mace, while Thor brings down the might of Mjolnir on the remaining one. The news of this assault and three of his men falling like fodder has reached Harold Jekyllson. He has gathered his crew and is now sailing through the air on his longship towards Thor. Suddenly, one of his men is shot straight into the air by an unknown force, which kills him instantly. The rest of the crew stares and gawks around them, trying to find the source of this slaughter, as Harold Jekyllson desperately tries to get them to regroup and prepare for an attack. But it's already too late. Before they know it, their longship is being bombarded, with a flurry of bullets from Eric's aircraft. This recent barrage has taken out tons of Vikings, and has reduced their numbers significantly. Some men perish, while Harold Jekyllson himself feels the wrath of the recent barrage of bullets as he stares at the hole in his side. Then a loud voice echoes through the night sky and across the empty streets of New York City. Jay Kelson! Jay Kelson! It is Thor, and he's now calling out the Viking that defeated him. Sigurd, Thor, and Sir Magnus of the Danes menacingly approach Harold Jekyllson as the Viking leader realizes what's in store for him. Thor Vikings number 5, See You in Valhalla. The final issue of the series opens up with a shot of the White House, and we can hear the President talking with one of his aides inside. We learn that the missiles the President had ordered to strike New York City are now ready and armed. The President is planning to nuke the entire city, but there is only one catch. According to the latest calculations, the nuclear fallout will not only affect the area in and around New York City, but it has a very good chance of reaching the President himself in Washington, D.C. within 24 
24 hours of the strike. Why wasn't I told about this earlier? The president now has to rethink his choices, as he's about to put a lot of lives at risk. Back in New York City, Thor, Sigurd, and Sir Magnus of the Danes are busy wreaking havoc and destruction on any and every Viking that dares cross their path. Just like the humans they slaughtered, the three of them are slicing, decapitating, disemboweling, and dismembering each one of the Vikings with the same brutality they had shown their victims. Back on the ground, the citizens of New York City can't help but look on in awe as their captors, their enslavers, are finally getting a taste of justice. Doctor Strange watches everything unfold as he smiles victoriously when a pair of brave teenagers opens their door and manages to inquire about what is happening. They, and most of the citizens, are confused by the sight of a Nazi fighter pilot, a Viking maiden, and a Catholic Teutonic knight fighting their battle. It is then that Doctor Strange introduces the two kids to their saviors, Sigurd, Sir Magnus of the Danes, Eric Lunroth, and of course Thor, someone the kids are well too familiar with. I'd go back in and lock the doors if I were you. This is about to get a little rough, and rough it is about to get indeed. Sigurd and Thor's eyes sport the same bloodlust that the citizens once saw in the eyes of the Vikings. Within the next few minutes, any remaining Vikings on the ground have been cut down by Thor, Sigurd, and Sir Magnus of the Danes, and the two ancient warriors are clearly unimpressed. These Vikings were barely a challenge for them, and they now want to face Harold Jekyllson. Thor tells them that he is still up on his flying longship, fighting Eric. Once Eric has taken care of the longship, he is bound to show up on the ground, but then Thor menacingly looks at them and adds, but mark me, and mark me well, Jekyllson is mine. Back in the air, Eric has been trying to shoot down the flying longship, but the damn thing simply won't go down, or for that matter go up in flames no matter how many bullets he shoots. Harold Jekyllson, meanwhile, has managed to gather his men and his own bearings. He and his men soon launch a flurry of arrows at Eric's aircraft, and most of them find their mark. One even manages to pierce the cockpit window, missing Eric's face by a mere few inches. But this is what Eric wanted. Despite his aircraft failing and losing fuel rapidly, he wanted the Vikings mad, and he wanted them to follow him. It doesn't matter that he's low on ammo, he has another plan in mind. He flies towards the Statue of Liberty and loops around it while the Vikings try to follow his every move desperately. Sir Magnus of the Danes and Sigurd look on in awe from the ground below, but the two of them also can't help but feel that Eric is already hogging all the limelight. Thor agrees, but he knows Harold Jekyllson, the Viking leader, wouldn't wait this long to face him, not unless he's already on the ground below. And as Thor finishes this thought, Harold Jekyllson stabs his long sword directly through Thor's torso, impaling the God of Thunder instantly. Sigurd and Sir Magnus of the Danes quickly turn around, but even they are no match for Harold Jekyllson. He hurls Sigurd away with a simple swipe of his arm, and when Sir Magnus tries to attack him, Harold Jekyllson slashes him with his long sword, which leads to a huge gash in his helmet and breaks Sir Magnus's long sword. Quite some army, Thunder God. A whore at arms? An oaf encased in tin? You must be very proud of yourself. But Thor isn't having any of it. He calls Mjolnir to his side, and then quickly uppercuts Harold Jekyllson with his hammer. He then orders the Viking leader to get up and face him, and with a huge, horrific cry, the Viking leader leaps at Thor. His skull has been split wide open, and his rotting brain is about to fall out of it. But Harold Jekyllson seems more determined than ever to kill Thor once and for all. Thor clutches his sides in an attempt to cover the hole Harold Jekyllson bestowed upon him earlier, when suddenly, the Viking leader prepares to slash at him with his long sword. But when Harold Jekyllson slashes, Thor blocks the attack with his hammer. Sadly, the Viking leader is too fast. He takes his free arm and thrusts it directly into the hole in Thor's torso that he had created earlier. Thor howls in pain, but with a powerful swipe of his hammer, he breaks off the free arm of Harold Jekyllson using Mjolnir. Up in the air, Eric is in a new predicament as he sees the remaining Vikings jump at his aircraft from the longship in a suicidal attempt to take him down. Many get chopped up by the propeller, but many more manage to find their mark, and soon they are clawing and slashing at the aircraft. After a minute or so, Eric starts to hurtle towards the ground as he desperately tries to use his sidearm to fight off the approaching attackers. Get your filthy hands off of my aircraft, you bunch of bloody bastards! But it's already too late. The aircraft has stalled and is now pummeling towards the ground with increasing speed. Eric has no choice but to put on his parachute, get out of the aircraft, and bail. The aircraft, along with the Vikings that cling on to it, goes and crashes directly into the Viking longship, killing any and every remaining Viking instantly. Limbs, wood, and metal debris fall all around him as Eric descends towards the ground using his parachute. Compliments of the Luftwaffe Mine Herren, and don't you fucking forget it! Back on the ground, Thor is struggling to keep Harold Jekyllson away from him. The Viking leader is pressing his longsword into 
to Thor's forearm and shoulder while Thor uses his other arm to keep Harold Jacobson's face away. He tells the Viking leader that it's about to be over, his crew is gone, and soon it will be his turn. But this only makes Harold Jacobson desperate and more hungry for Thor's blood. The Viking leader bites into Thor's arm and pulls a huge chunk of his flesh away. The sheer pain from this assault sends Thor crumbling down onto the road, and Harold Jacobson capitalizes on this by stepping on Thor's injured hand. He then lifts up Thor and tries to choke him, and despite the God of Thunder's best attempts, he is soon losing consciousness, as his eyes begin to roll into the back of his head. Harold Jekyllson continues choking Thor, taunting him, condemning him, and most of all cursing the gods of Asgard in the process. But as he looks up, he sees Thor's other allies staring at him, Sigurd, Eric, and Sir Magnus of the Danes stare at him casually. Come to the aid of your lord, your hero, eh? Why would we? He is Thor. Harold Jekyllson doesn't understand them, and before he can comprehend what Thor's allies are saying, the god of thunder has freed himself from the Viking leader's grasp. Thor then pulls his arm away and brings in a mighty huge punch, which sends a huge sonic boom echoing throughout the entire city. And once the smoke and dust has subsided, Harold Jekyllson is nowhere to be seen. Sigurd, Eric, and Sir Magnus of the Danes, all of them are confused. What happened to Harold Jekyllson? And we then see what exactly happened to him. Harold Jekyllson, or what remains of him, is now in space, floating high above the earth, drifting away into nothing but empty space. The End Marvelous Verdict Thor Vikings is a gritty and gory tale from the early 2000s published by Max Comics, which was a division of Marvel Comics for more mature audiences. The comic has its own flaws and plot holes, but the story of a curse going wrong still seems to hold well. The theme of a higher power that grants wishes by misconstruing and misinterpreting one's words, resulting in utter chaos, still holds up in today's time. The art is exceptional, the details are disturbing and true to the Viking lore, the slaughter and raiding is horrific. Thor has been portrayed as a broken man, yearning to win back not only his confidence, but his pride as well. And this is a new mature take on the famed Avenger, who is often portrayed as invincible in front of even the most powerful foes in the Marvel Universe. Harold Jacobson as a villain is ruthless, gritty, unforgiving, and unwavering. He's a great enemy for Thor, one that pushes the God of Thunder beyond his limits, forces him to view his own flaws, and finds new ways to overcome and defeat him. Overall, if you're looking for a gritty and gory tale that sheds new light on Thor and explores mature subjects, then Thor Vikings is a great read. The short yet information-rich comic series has something for everyone. Whether you're a fan of Norse mythology or love some gritty artwork, Thor Vikings won't let you down.